In particular, in times of, of loss and transition, those promises that we've ha- hold on to come to light, that God has prepared a place for us. And this morning, again, we are starting a new series. It's going to be for 13 weeks, and we're going to walk with Abraham through his life from the book of Genesis. And from his story, you will see parts of your story where there are promises given, there's um, commands to follow and stepping out in faith. In his story, there's some missteps and miscalculations because of unknowing and because of fear, and there's perseverance continued through his life. Abraham is a very significant person in the life of Christianity and also in Judaism and also uh, those of the Muslim faith trace their roots back to him as well. His life occurred around uh, 6,000 or so years ago. And 4,000 years later, the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, wrote these words for us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, talking about the Old Testament, talking about things that were written before. And he wrote this, Such things were written in the Scriptures long ago to teach us. One reason why we look at Scripture is to learn, is to grow, to understand and have wisdom. And the Scriptures give us hope, and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. I love that passage, and it helps me in communicating the Scriptures, the Word of God. Number one, they're given to us so that we can learn, that we can grow, that our minds would be transformed. And in so doing, that we would have hope just like Abraham had hope, that we would be encouraged because in life there are things that are difficult. As we, present tense, as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Abraham held on to promises that were given to him and because of his faith, it was credited to him as righteousness. We also hold on to promises from Scripture that give us hope, that give us encouragement. And so I have a a question for you, and we're going to put it up on the screens here. And I don't have microphones, and I'm going to have to repeat it for people um, online. But I want to hear just briefly from you a promise that you have been holding on to. And here is the question. What is one of God's promises that has been significant to you. So I want to hear from you, and I can start. One promise that's been um, important and significant to me is I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you into the very ends of the earth. Okay? So that is one from me, and I, I want to hear from you. I mean, if you can say it nice and loud, and we go one at a time, what is one of God's promises that has been significant to you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Amen. He's going to finish what he started in her children. Thanks, Lori, for that. Okay, anything else? Any other promises? Forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 8. Thank you for that, Mike. That's right. Good promise. Okay? Others? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fear not. Yeah, fear not for I am with you. That, that command has been given to us so many times in Scripture and is so important. Thanks, Jill, for that. Okay? Others? Yeah. Amen. Right? Come on. He is coming again. What a great promise that we hold on to. Others? I leave you peace. Yeah, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, I give to you. Right, Dave? Okay. So I hand, yeah. He will deliver us. He will deliver me. And he will. 
That's right, Eric. Very good. Okay. Jim, did you have something? Yeah. What a great promise that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And indeed he has. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, John 3.16. And he does and he has. Yeah. Matt, go ahead. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Amen. He's citing uh, Thomas, you know, where they had the interaction. Look at the holes. Hey, I, I'm here. I exist and believe. And I like the last thing he said, let's do it, right? Let's do this. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, come on, Lisa, right? Did you guys hear that? That was Psalm 23, the beginning, and then, you know, I have everything I need because the Lord is my shepherd, and he walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death. What a great promise. It's so good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I didn't catch all that. What was that? Yeah, so good. God would have compassion on us, on me, that we could have compassion on others. Yeah, that flow through of God to us and then through us. So good. Yeah. Why don't we take, yeah, one more. Yeah, Dave. Hmm, thanks for that. They've shared that um, this was a promise in the Old Testament, and, and uh, Jesus recited it, that a smoldering wick, one barely hanging on, I will not snuff out. Right? Or a bruised reed that, that he brings back to life. And we're grateful, grateful for that. And we could spend more time reciting these promises. And they are great. And they are precious. And they are important. Can you have one more? Yeah. Mm hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The Lord himself is with you. He will be, um, <laughs> do not be anxious and afraid. He strengthens you and goes before us. Amen, Ken. And so, again, we have so many promises and we ourselves are holding on to and they are precious to us because God has spoken them to us. And so as we read about Abraham and as we think about the promises that are dear to our heart, the hope is again through this series, through the Old Testament, through Scripture, that you again would be encouraged, that your hope would grow, our strength would be renewed as we ourselves wait and experience the fulfillment of these promises and look forward to what God has yet in store for us. Thank you for sharing. And so the story of Abraham starts in the end of chapter 10 of Genesis and then really comes robustly in chapter 11 for a good 10 chapters or so. And so just to bring us up to speed, if you are familiar with Genesis and your Bible, you know, as you read it, you open the, the story. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 describe God's creation. And the first couple, Adam and Eve, also describes from our ancient ancestors our rebellion and fall from God's good plan for us. After those things in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3... We read about the story of their sons, Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel, and what took place with these two young men where Cain murdered his brother Abel. After that, in chapter 5, there's a genealogy that brings this story from Abraham and his descendants. These are real people, by the way, with real ancestors who really lived, up to a guy named Noah. 
And it talks about Noah and what was taking place back at that time. And of course, we're familiar with in chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, the story of Noah and the flood and God's redemption, of course, pointing towards Christ with this righteous man as God remakes the earth and recommits his plan and his, his promises to Noah. Then we'll read about Noah and his sons and his descendants and how they continue to fill the earth. And we come to a passage talking about this tower that was made because the people did not want to go and spread out throughout the earth. In Genesis chapter 11, about the Tower of Babel where God confuses the languages and continues to send us throughout the earth. And then there's a naming of one of the sons of Noah, Shem, and all of his descendants. And then it leads us to a guy named Terah, who fathered three sons, one being Abram. And you'll read the word Abram, which his name later was changed to Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And so, yep, here we are. Here's a slide. So... That brings us up to this chapter, just a very, very brief uh, understanding of the first events in Genesis. So here is Terah right here. Here's the father. And he had three sons. That's kind of hard to read, isn't it? Sorry about that. Okay. This is Abram. Okay. And he married Sarai, which her name was later changed to Sarah, as we will read through this story. So he had three sons, Abram. Nahor and Haran. And Haran had three children. Milcah is one. Ishka, these are two daughters, is another. And this guy here, the infamous Lot. This is a nephew of Abraham. And so we read about these individuals that were there. So here we are, Genesis chapter 11. If you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. And we're going to look at a, a, couple, a couple of verses here this morning from Genesis chapter 11 and then Genesis chapter 12. So this is Genesis chapter 11, and I'm reading from the NIV, the new NIV, <laughs> one of the new NIVs. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of of his son Abram, and they together, as a family unit, set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Cana. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just in ancient Israel, and we'll see how how well we can read these. Sorry for that. So here is kind of the map, and if you are interested in maps, this might have interest to you. So Mediterranean Sea is right here. This is now, Israel is in here. And this was before, obviously, Israel was a nation. And so more than likely, the family came from here, which is Ur. This is uh, Babylonia, by the way. And there's some thoughts, perhaps he came from this region, but most people think he is from here it's because of various things. I'm not going to go into all those details. But more than likely, they're, they're, they're heading here to the land of Cana, which is down here. But they followed, they didn't go across the desert here. They followed Euphrates River up, 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 up to this co- t- town called, or city called Haran. Now, scholars think that this is probably where Terah's um, son, this is Abraham's brother, went up and settled there. And at some point, Haran died, and it says in the presence of his father. So he could have went down here and was with his father, or they were up here, and while they were together, he died. But at some point, he, he, he did die. And so at that point in the story, there was a decision that had to be made. Abram had to make a decision. His decision was 
primarily threefold. One, he could, go, he could have gone back to the land of his ancestors. He could have gone all the way back down to Ur, and that could have been his choice, saying, I'm going to go back here. Another was he could have just settled there. He had relatives there in that land. It was familiar, and that was his second choice. Now, a third choice could have been for him to continue this journey that originally he joined with his father to go to this land of Canaan. And at this point, in a point of decision-making, a point of a crossroad, this is when God spoke directly to this man named Abram. Now, he was 75 years old, okay? Now, in their day, and Abram, by the way, lived to be 175, perhaps he was a youngish man. But those of you who are 75 years old know that's not necessarily a youngish person, okay? But I want us to note that often in times of transition, in times when we're considering um, choices to make that perhaps will greatly affect our future, and those times when we're looking for direction, often this is when God meets with us. And this was true in the life of this man, Abram, that God met with him. This next slide is the point of this message and the main point of this entire series. So if you remember anything, I want you to remember this line. Here it is. Trust God's promises by living a life of faith. That is a loaded, intentionally loaded sentence. Trust God's promises. And we together labeled and listed and vocalized some promises that we have hid in our hearts this morning. I want you and God would have you to trust his promises. And we so do by living a life of faith. Now, we'll see in Abraham's story, and I'm so grateful that Scripture gives us not just the high points, his victories, but also communicates the times in which he failed. Because there are times in my life and in your life that we don't live exactly what we believe. What about then? What about God's faithfulness? And through the passages and through these chapters, we'll see how these things impacted Abraham. And we'll see how these things impact us as well. So Abram had this choice. God spoke to him. And here is what was communicated. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, go from your people, go from your father's household to a land that I'll show you. Now, Abram, there's a promise in this. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whomever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples 
on earth. There's the gospel right there as well. All the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now put yourself in Abram's shoes. Here he was with his wife, and by the way, there's a little foreshadowing that we're given in the last chapter that Sarai, Abram's wife, did not have children. She was barren. And so Abram's dad died, his brother died, now he's responsible for a wife. He has this nephew Lot, and he had to make a decision, and then God speaks to him. And his request was significant. Leaving what he knew, leaving the land of the familiar for the land of promise. Now, I don't know about you, but it would have taken a lot because... <laughs> And there's a joke there. It would have taken a lot as well. But um, Ching, Dave, that was not necessary. Okay. His security was in who he knew. His security was in the language. His security was in the culture. What if God speaks to you? Say, hey, by the way, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave this country. I want to leave. I want you to leave your property and go. To a place I will show you, right? That's a big ask. Will you trust my direction? Will you follow me because I ask you to? And when God asks us to do something, He promises to be with us, and he promises something more. But often, in order to receive the next thing, we have to let go to the thing that we are holding on to. Haven't you found that to be the case? Right? Will you let go of what has been your people or your community or your security or your comfort? And will you trust me that I have something greater and grander and better? Will you follow me? In God's covenant, and we'll see this, and by the way, this covenant, as I was reading, I just wrote down how often it was repeated in his, Abraham's life. I counted seven times where God reassured him of these promises. He was reminded, he was reminded, and it was refined, and it was clarified, and in particular at times in which Abram struggled and he had a choice. God reminded him of the promise. In your times of struggle, in your times of wondering, in your times where it's difficult and things did not go how you thought it should go, remind yourself of the promises of God. Critical, important. And these promises, of course, were for this man. But extends farther and greater and grander even to us where scripture would say that we are children of Abraham because we are of the faith of Abraham. Significant biblical doctrines are seen in this passage and Paul references him often and Abraham is mentioned about 234-ish times in Scripture. And notice that there is a connection with our response to the promise giver in faith and then all of the things that God says 
He will do. Don't you like that? I will make your name great. I will bless you. I will watch over you. I will be with you. Abraham had a choice to believe the promises of God. We also, some 6,000 years later, have a choice if we're going to believe the promises of God. The essence of faith was given to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, says this, And without faith, trust, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God, want to be close to God, want to experience God. Whoever would want to do this must believe, number one, that He exists. And number two, which is amazing, that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. If you have sought God in your life, you will understand and recognize that indeed He exists and He is powerful and He is supreme and He is Lord and He is Savior and He is Master and He is Maker and He's a friend. He's completely other and intimately personal. He is God with us the hope of glory and in him are promises and reward and goodness and grace just like Abraham we and every person has to deal with the issue is is there a God does this being exist what is the nature of this being? And Scripture, in specific revelation, tells us about Him and the promises. And if you want to draw near to Him, we hold on to these things. So Abram, at 75 years old, could have returned to the life he had known, returned to the places and the people and the things, and he had that choice, and we would not hear about Abram anymore if he made that choice. Verse 4 records, So Abram, went act of faith not knowing but just hearing and trusting so Abram went as the Lord had told him he trusted and gave his life to the one who promised to him and this is the essence of our faith will you trust God for eternity like Bill trusted God for eternity will we align ourselves to his compass and saying wherever you go I want to be with you I want to love you and know you and make you known because with you is far greater than anything this world has to offer this is faith and Abraham went on the truth that he knew, the promise that he had, and his nephew Lot with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now he took with him his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all his stuff and 
he had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they collectively set out for the land of Cana. And they arrived there. We're going to look at a few things, what faith produces. Number one, faith produces obedience. The truth is that if we obey, if we believe, then we follow we align ourselves. We take steps based on the promise and the person we know. And often, no, let me make that stronger. In our faith journey, there is a believing and a leaving. Remember when you came to faith. I remember when I truly came to faith at 17. It was grabbing onto the new life that God promised. It was leaving my old way of life and being transformed in the renewing of my mind. And saying no to some people and some places. I'm not going to do that anymore. And grabbing onto a promise of God of new life that would incur greater joy and greater peace and great contentment and these things working in me that I could not produce myself. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, by the Spirit of God renewing us. Often, I would say always, in the believing, there is a, a, a leaving in the sense of I'm leaving these old things and going on towards what is better, what is new, and what is promised. A new way of thinking. And sometimes it does require us to leave some people and places. And sometimes it's family saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And trusting that what is promised is better and is true. And Abram had to let go of a land and a people and a nation and an old way of connecting in a hope to receive a better land, a better people, a better nation. Please read, if you would, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at and we'll, we'll dive into, we'll dip into that part of his story a little bit. It sums up his life. But in there talking about people elite of faith who left these things looking for an eternal nation, a better kingdom, which we are anticipating. And people like Bill and Lois and Sandy and those who have gone before us are there. It is faith. And faith is like a bridge, if you go to the next slide, that Abraham had to step out. He knew the first step to follow me and go to Cana, to a land that I will show you. And what was farther on was less clear to him, but often is how it works. Just take a first step. I will follow you. I do trust you. And it moves us forward. We follow and he rewards our part is to believe and follow Him. His part is to bless and follow through. In so doing, He is glorified in us, and we are satisfied in Him. So again, in the story of Abram, which turned into Abraham, or Abraham, he is reminded as he continues to step forward, there's greater details that come into play, and in it is true in your journey of faith as well. 
So in verse 6, we see this choice made, hanging on to this promise of a blessing of a nation, blessing of nations to him, to those who are far off, and we see him continuing to travel. Verse 6, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah in Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now there, again a second time, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Abram, this is the place which I was talking to you about. He owned nothing there. He was a foreigner, and God promised him more specifically, at this place, to your offspring, I will give this land. Again, you will find in your journey of faith with the Lord, there's general promises that have been given. Then as we move, we'll see how specifically these things are fulfilled. This is the Lord's provision, and someone will provide a, some money to you, or this is the family in which I want to tie you in, and God gives you a church family. These are the people. This is the place. Here is a provision that will help you in these things. Help us in our journey of faith. How many things in your lifetime have you forgotten, by the way? Have you forgotten anything? <laughs> If you ask me where my keys are right now, I probably couldn't tell you, right? There's lots of things that we've forgotten, right? But it's helpful for us to remember, in particular, in times of transition, times in which something, uh, life throws us a curveball, so to speak, to remember God's provision for us in the past will give us faith for the future. Do you hear that sentence? God has not failed me. We sing about it yet. And guess what? God will not fail you ever. Right? Now sometimes the promises are fulfilled differently than we and our <laughs> size of a pea wisdom. Right? Trust God that his promises will be true. Abraham believed God stepped out in following him like so many of us in this room. But I want you to remember that faith produces obedience. If we will believe, we follow and in following, we leave some things to gain some others, some better things. Continue to step forward. Abraham's faith, and faith does produce a following and obedience. And as he continues to move forward, we see something else. As God speaks to him, some clarity. At this point in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, after the Lord tells them this land and the Canaanites were there at that time, right? Enemies, foreigners. Verse 7, second part of it. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Second thing that faith produces is worship. <laughs> it's worship. You believe, you obey, you follow, then you get to... Look at the timing. <laughs> There's pause right there. <laughs> I think that was snow coming off the roof, is what I think. But the timing is significant. <laughs> Could come off at any time. That's where he found. That was pretty cool, actually. <laughs> Let's take a drink. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm going to spit this out. <laughs> that was pretty amazing. That might be the only thing you remember of today. I don't know. <laughs> okay, we're talking about something. Ah, worship, right. <laughs> That's right. So, God, so we get to know God and His power, right, and His timing. <laughs> and it turns into faith-producing worship. Abraham built an altar, which is an appropriate response. <laughs> Once you see something of glory, of beauty, and obviously God is beyond all of the things that we know, we get to know Him in part. It, um, what's the word? It turns up in us. It creates a response in us of praise and worship. I love worshiping here. I love worshiping with you. Right? One of the reasons, the primary reason, my hope is that when we come together, you come because you want to worship God. Right? That His promises are good. His mercy is new. His forgiveness is deep. And so we gather together, and we gather together to worship God. God be praised. And we don't do these songs as a warm-up. Gage, God, you're worthy. You are mighty to save. You are the everlasting God. Your promises are new. It is so good. And we worship him as singing. And it's great to blend our voices because we can sing the same things and think the same things um, together. And it helps us. And we worship him during the week. And we worship him in various ways. But faith will always produce worship. So if you have faith, you will have worship. And if there's worship, then there will be faith. Believing in God's promises. So if a person has faith, there's obedience. If a person has faith, there is worship. And I encourage you to do that in corporate settings and private settings to worship God for his goodness. Abraham, when he received a further clarification of the provision and the promise of God, built an altar, a space to worship God, a place to worship God. And I bet the Canaanites were wondering that this guy was a little off his rocker. His worship and building an altar, by the way, cost him something. His wealth was in his animals, really, back then, agricultural community. He was a herdsman, right? Sacrificed, honored God as Abel had before him. Regardless of what the people thought around him, he stopped to praise God. I encourage you to stop and praise God repeatedly. As we continue to read, verse 8. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel. These are places that are there in Israel. Okay, This isn't a made-up story. There he pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, outside of Jerusalem, about six miles or so, as far as I understand. There he built, again, an altar to the Lord. And there's this added section, and called on the name of the Lord. So where there is faith, there will be prayer. Faith produces prayer. Not only is there a following and obedience, which we do, there is a worship of the greatness of God, which we do. Then there is a relational element that this is just not a mute idol that someone crafts and puts up and that we burn incense to. Oh no, this is the living creator who is with us who not only speaks to us, but encourages us to communicate with. Aren't you grateful that God listens to prayer? Right? 
God speaks to us by His Spirit. God speaks to us through His Word. God illuminates what He's saying to us in various ways. If we say we have faith, then this faith produces obedience. It produces worship. It produces prayer, interaction with God. One verse that scares me in the New Testament is these group of people who are doing things in Jesus' name. And Jesus looked at him and said, Who are you? Away from me because I never knew you. One of the ways we know God is through the promises of the Word, through the redemption of His Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit to us, and also interaction with Him through prayer. They called on the name of the Lord. So if we have faith, we will call on the name of the Lord. I would encourage you this year as we are launching into whatever resolution you are making, fan the flame, the prayer network in your heart, your connection, listen, interact. Lastly, and we'll come into a landing here, verse 9, we're going to stop with this verse for today. <laughs> and Abram, he set out and continued, you want to underline that, he continued towards the Negva, which is a desert area. Faith produces perseverance. And you'll see this all throughout Scripture, and we'll see this in the life of Abram. Turn to Abraham, and again, he did not always do it perfectly, but every time he fell down, he got back up. Get up! Get up! Get up! Continued to believe, continued to move forward, and he did so. So faith produces perseverance. If you have genuine faith, then you will persevere in it. Continue to believe, continue to trust, continue to move forward. This is why Scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good. Doing good sometimes costs us. It is difficult at times, but the promise is, you see this doing and you see this believing, this promise, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we what? Do not give up hope and encouragement so we continue moving forward. At times you may become weary. When we are weak, then He is strong. At times you may want to quit. Well, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. At times you may have people tell you to curse God and die. The Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, Job. The one who perseveres to the end will be saved. We overcome by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Come on, Joshua. Paul, fight the fight, finish the race, keep the faith. For what is in store for you is the crown of righteousness that the Lord will award to you on that day. Second Timothy. It's one of the verses that I read with Bill just yesterday. And he is receiving that reward now. Back to the main point and we're going to conclude. If you go back to that main slide it would be great. The, the first one. Trust God's promises by living 
a life of faith. Sub, there you go. Trust God's promises by living a life of faith. Circle it, highlight it, be encouraged. Faith is letting go so we can hold on. Faith produces obedience and worship and prayer and perseverance. And let's thank God for the promises that we have. Take hope. Be encouraged. Wait patiently. The Lord will fulfill his promises to you. Next week, we're going to continue, and we'll see some of his missteps even next week. But I want you to engage yourself when God may be speaking to us, what he will be speaking to us. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to conclude with a song. At the end, there'll be some people here to pray with you for anything. Please take advantage of that. And I'm going to encourage you, you know, to observe some of these painting things, what have you. Go downstairs to the library. There's free books. There's lots of stuff. I encourage those who've worked so hard and go and do that. So let's pray together. God, thank you again for this day. And the new year, God, with winds and cold and ice, God. God, we're grateful for the celebrations over Christmas time. We're grateful for what is yet next. We're grateful for the lives and legacies of faithful friends who are now with you, God. And God, we say yes to you again today of continuing in this following of faith of you. God, I don't know what's in store this year. I don't. It's already things that happened that I was not anticipating. But God, you know. And God, we trust you. God, thank you that you're here even now. Thank you, God, that you hear our hearts even now. Thank you, God, that you are with us even now. And you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, God, for the faithfulness of those who have gone before. Thank you, God, that we have examples in our life of faithfulness. And God, help us to continue to be encouraged, to walk forward, to hang on to your promises. God, we ask that this year would be one of greater obedience, would be one of greater worship, would be one of greater prayer. Thank you for enabling us to continue to walk through whatever because you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. Thank you for your great and precious promises. We praise you today in Jesus' name.